The relationship between founders and investors is a weird symbiotic phenomenon. We entrepreneurs create companies, we work day and night, we lose sleep and get gray hair to see our vision through. And someone on the other side provides the funding and just sits and relax while we make them money. That's just a rookie oversimplification. The reality is most of the companies, most of the startups that you can think of could not exist if it wasn't for venture capital. That includes your now public companies like Google and Airbnb or ClickUp, your TikTok and your Candy Crush and your Telegram. Gary Tan published a video the other day on how he turned a $300,000 investment into $2 billion. By the way, we offered Gary a seat at this table slash video, but he, he refused. Anyway, his example is, I think, is a great case study for today. He invested in Coinbase in their first ever round of funding. And now that Coinbase went public, his investment multiplied over 6,000 X. That is transformative, life-changing money. Tan went from entrepreneur to being worth a few million dollars to being worth hundreds of millions of dollars, all with one accurate bet. And that is very much the investment thesis of venture capital. Most startups fail. Everybody knows that. Most startups will fail. Experienced investors are very much prepared to lose their money because they're not looking for 1x or 2x returns on any given investment. They're looking to find that 6,000x unicorn, that life-changing win. And you would think that there's a simple approach to it. I have money, I invest, I get money if the company succeeds. But there is a whole industry of venture capital with layers of partners, limited partners, funds, and legal structures. And most entrepreneurs come into this world having no idea how any of this stuff works many investors too, actually. So I had a broad idea of how it worked, but as I did research for this video, I realized how hard this info is to find and to understand. Luckily for you, we are good at getting complex things into simpler form. And helping startups navigate this mess is quite literally what our products do. Shameless plug. Let's get on with the video. Gary Tan was probably a direct shareholder of Coinbase. He invested some of his own cash in a simple early stage round. They even called it a friends and family under the S1 filing. And this is the model of an angel investor. As the company grows, you have institutional investors, venture capitalists. They're not investing their own cash, but rather other people's money. A VC raises money from other people and decides where to invest it in exchange for a commission. And the economics of doing one or the other are drastically different. But before we even dive into that, we need to understand the type of businesses that can raise this type of money and how that cycle works. Companies come in all shapes and sizes, but only a handful of them are venture fundable. You may hear talk in the startup press about this and that company raising millions of dollars, but for the most part, these are fast, growth, massively scalable companies. And that's why they can and must raise capital to expand. There's really no terminology to tell them apart, but I like to use startups versus small businesses. Yes, if we're strict about their definitions, all startups begin as small businesses, but the difference I want to make here relates to their potential for scale. So let's draw a line and paint that picture. Say a developer and a UI designer got tired of their day jobs. They've built a name and a portfolio for themselves and decide to start their agency. To me, this is the very definition of this category of small business. This is by all means a tech company, but in order to scale, they will need to hire more and more designers and developers. Their margins, the profit the company makes after covering expenses will always be limited because they are essentially selling man hours. Can they reach great scale? They can build an agency with a thousand engineers, but that is a long shot. Examples here are the McKinsey's and the Ernst & Young's of the world, massive consulting companies that still sell mostly services performed by humans, but those are exceptions. Can they raise venture capital? Unlikely, and definitely not at the idea or early revenue stage. Those companies are usually formed by two or three partners who bring in some capital of their own to get started. One of those partners might even be an executive co-founder, while the other or others bring the expertise and do most of the work. And then the executive co-founder brings the capital. But that is not a venture capital investor. It's probably a relationship that you've already built and that you trust to get in bed with you for this business. There's nothing wrong with being a small business type of company. The US economy was built on these small businesses. The majority of companies fall within this category. Just know that if this is you, 
venture capital is not for you. On the other hand, we have the tech startup, the Silicon Valley type startup. This is the company that you read about on TechCrunch, a company that has found a transformative market opportunity and that is using technology to solve it in an extremely scalable way. Uber is not a car or a taxi company. It doesn't need to hire drivers or buy cars. It operates all over the world and can open an operation in a city with three employees because they're a marketplace. They're connecting drivers to riders. Same with Airbnb. They don't need to buy homes or rooms like a hotel. They're just connecting the players in this economy. That's the concept that I like to classify as tech startup. Once again, technically, the development shop is a tech startup, but I'm not using that dictionary definition. The story of how these companies fund their operation is very different. These are companies reaching for the moon, so they'll need to raise capital every couple of years, assuming, of course, they're doing well. For the most part, these companies will operate at a loss for years because everyone is betting on the large play. Think Amazon, who didn't turn a profit for decades, but today it completely dominates the e-commerce industry and AWS and streaming. So let's look at that Coinbase round as a case study. Coinbase went public a few months ago and it gave us some fantastic materials. As a company goes public, they need to release their financials, which gives us everything we need to infer how much money investors made from them. We made a whole video about how the process of a company going public works. So go check that out if you want. Coinbase raised, according to Crunchbase, six rounds of capital from seed, friends and family to series E. The first round in September 2012 is where Gary Tan participated with his 300K. Then comes series A in 2013, series B that same year, up to a massive 300 million series E in 2018. By the end of 2019, they were generating $533 million in revenue, which doubled to $1.2 billion by the end of 2020. They lost money in 2019, about $30 million, but they made about $320 million in profits, net profits in 2020. That's a business going from zero to $1.2 billion in revenue in eight years. That's $322 million in profit, doubling revenue year on year. And there's still room to grow, which is why they went public to raise even more money. But enough of me being a groupie. That is the funding story of Coinbase. You can see that they raised money about once a year since their inception. And here are some references on the number of users, the number of employees, and the revenue that they had when each one of those rounds happened. By the way, we sent a weekly company forensics newsletter with a similar breakdown of any company that announced funding during the week. You can subscribe with the link I'll drop in the description. So let's start at the beginning. Those angel investors in that earliest of stages. Angel investors are wealthy individuals investing their own capital. So an angel investor can very well come in with 10,000, 50,000, all the way up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Though investors who write checks that big are usually called super angels. In that cycle of company funding, angel investors usually come in the very early stages because coming into that $300 million round for Coinbase with just $100,000 would be out of place. In order to be an accredited angel investor, according to the SEC, you have to fulfill one of two conditions. You have to either have a net worth of a million dollars, excluding marriages, tax returns, and the value of your home, or you need to have an income of over $200,000 as an individual or $300,000 as a household. In the US, this is not a high bar by any means. So the cool part of being an angel investor is that you get to decide on which companies you invest. These are individuals who get to meet founders, who get to shake their hands and get their hands dirty with due diligence and with understanding the ins and outs of their businesses. Most successful angel investors are entrepreneurs themselves who maybe ended up with some capital after a successful startup of their own and are now using that capital to invest in other founders. The question here is experience. How do you tell good companies from bad companies? How do you figure out if a founder has their stuff figured out? As an angel investor, it's your call and no one else's. So investing at these very early stages for a business is obviously more risky. Most publications agree that 75% of venture-backed startups fail. Some even say 90%. The Coinbases are true exceptions, the one in a thousand, if you will. While you can spot these early traits of success, it's really hard to tell if a company has what it takes to become a unicorn, especially at this stage. An additional risk for angels is deal flow. 
after all, they're individuals. There's only so many startups that will be able to reach them, and there's only so many Zoom calls they can take. Another risk here is that as an angel, you are funding one part of the round, but not the rest. If you're the first check a company is getting, you have the additional risk of the company not being able to secure any other checks, either for that round or for future rounds. So overall, this is a high risk, but high reward game. So what are the options to invest with less risk? To overcome some of the perils, the concept of angel groups and the concept of syndicates has been created. An angel group is formed by an investor who's perhaps more connected or who has a good network of wealthy individuals who want to get in on this venture capital party, but perhaps aren't that experienced or don't have access to deals themselves. Essentially, the angel investors pay a fee to be a part of the group and get access to the deals. Those fees are usually in the $1,000 to $5,000 a year range and are meant to cover a small team for the angel group. That may include analysts to find startups and filter them, maybe do some due diligence, legal teams, or simply the task of organizing this monthly session with investors to look at the deal options. It is a lot of work. By the way, some angel groups try to charge the entrepreneur for pitching. And if you see that, you wanna run the other way. Angel groups also sometimes take an additional fee called a carried interest, or carry. It's a finder's fee for the management team of the angel group. And a 20% carry is pretty standard. And here's more or less how it works. Let's say an angel investor in the group chooses to invest in Slidebean, a $50,000 check. Slidebean grows, kills the competition, and gets acquired by SpaceX for some reason. And then that investor's stake is now worth $5 million, 100X, which I'm oversimplifying. So the investor's earnings are $5 million minus the $50,000 they invested originally, or $4 million, 950,000. Out of those earnings, the 20% carry would represent 990,000. So the angel group gets to keep that as a finder's fee. Now the advantage here is that you're co-investing with people for good or worse. There's maybe some group or herd mentality in these cases. Peer pressure might get some investors over the edge to come into a company, but at the same time, a turned off investor can make the deal fall apart. Another advantage for the founder is that usually, ideally, investors bring money through an investment vehicle. Essentially, all the investors form an LLC with proportional ownership to each of their investments. So the LLC invests in the business, so you end up with only one investor in the cap table. Sounds like a small advantage, but when you have to get papers signed, it's easier to chase the legal representative of the LLC than going out to fetch 20 plus signatures from all the investors. It also makes processing the carried interest a lot easier. Now this legal structure only has a small annual operation cost, which is shared by all the investors. The deal and the potential for them is pretty similar to the angel approach. They choose the companies they win or lose depending on the companies they chose to invest in, except for the fees. Syndicates are rather similar, but they have been designed to be more online. In an angel group, there's this idea of physicality, at least pre-COVID. Investors get together, and they decide. It's expected that investments will be $10,000, $20,000 per investor at least. On a syndicate, the transaction is mostly online, and as an angel, you can come in to the group with as little as $1,000. Now, are those Slidebean and Coinbase successes enough to make up for the failed companies? Sort of, but I'll get to that in a sec. Before we dive into that, we need to understand the last structure here, which is venture capital funds. The most established investment process for startups is the concept of venture capital. Instead of individuals investing themselves, a venture capital fund is formed around a person, usually called the managing director or the general partner, the GP. The GP is usually a well-known investor who has had success on a different VC fund or as an entrepreneur and who other investors trust with their money. Because you see, venture capitalists raise money themselves, then they invest in companies. This is called a fund. They go out to angels, institutions, even governments, and raise anywhere from a few million dollars to a hundred billion dollars, literally, SoftBank. Go watch our video about them. So the way this works is the GP goes on a roadshow to try to get investors on board the fund. What he or she is selling is their ability to pick fantastic companies and to help them succeed. Now, all this money gets put into a bucket called a fund, and it's usually an LLC. So the fund is a pile of cash out of which the firm invests. If it does well, a new fund gets created for a new bucket of investors. And these investors are called limited partners or LPs. And you'll often see terms like 
Sequoia Capital Fund 3 or 500 Starters LLC Fund 2. That's the number of the fund that you are part of. And it's this legal entity that's an investor in the different businesses. So by owning a percentage of that fund, you indirectly participate in all the companies the firm invested in. The other day I was on a call with some random person and he told me, hey, I'm your investor. And after seeing my very confused face, he told me he was part of the Valfounded Startups fund that invested in us. Good, I guess he is an investor, but it was a little awkward. Anyway, some funds have well-earned reputation for doing really well, or at least appearing to do so. Peter Thiel's Founders Fund or Sequoia Sequoia Capital, and Dreesing Horowitz, First Round Capital, or Union Square Ventures. Those are some kind of brand name examples. If you look at their portfolios, you can see that they funded these rock star companies before they were rock stars. Their money, their help, and even the credibility of having that fund on board inevitably helped catapult these companies. But those are rock star VCs and they are the exception. So let's go back to Coinbase. Union Square Ventures invested $6 million in Series A and Dreesen $25 million in Series B. Assuming those rounds translated into 10, 15% of the company, that would still translate into a lot of money for everyone. But for the limited partners, it's not as much as you would think because the fees for putting your money on a venture fund are pretty high. VCs make money in two ways. First, they collect 2% of the fund on an annual basis for at least four or five years. And this is essentially an asset management fee. So on a $100 million fund, for example, the annual fee would be $2 million, and then another, and then another for the next few years. And that's just cash payment to the GP and the team, regardless of how the investments did. This has drawn some criticism because it's a hefty cash compensation that happens regardless of how well the fund does. In addition, the fund also makes a standard 20% carry at interest, the same carry that we talked about before. It gets split between the team, looking something like this. Now, if you wanna geek with me about the legal structure, you're gonna have the VC firm, which is a traditional corporation with employees and such. The LPs and the fund itself invest money in the fund, which is a separate legal entity. Again, 2% of the fund gets paid to the firm every year. The fund invests in the startups themselves. When the fund gets money from an acquisition or a sale, it pays 20% of the profits to the firm. That's the carry. And then it pays out to the limited partners. This way, a firm can have multiple funds with different groups of investors. So does the model work? Is it profitable for investors to invest in you? It depends. Let's do some math to see how profitable this can be. Let's assume that an individual is faced with the choice of becoming an angel investor, joining a venture capital fund, or just putting their money in a safe bet, like an ETF. This investor has a million dollars of funds that they are willing to bet. The simplest option by all means is an ETF in the stock market. Most publications agree it could bring seven to 10% returns after adjusting for inflation. So in eight years, their money would grow to some $1.7 million. Let's go with the angel investing scenario. The investor chooses 20 companies and invests an average of $50,000 in each one of them. The average valuation for these companies is $4 million pre-money which is pretty standard. That means that the average stake this investor is gonna get in each one of those companies is 1.25%. Now, of course, we're assuming that $50,000 is part of a larger fund. That 1.25% is the percentage that this specific investor got. As we mentioned, 75% of venture-backed startups fail. So 15 out of these companies will die. For the five that are left, let's assume that they go on to raise additional capital. On average, each one of them raises three additional rounds of funding. So series A through series C. For each one of those rounds, the investor gets diluted by some 20%. So their ownership per company goes from 1.25% to 0.61%. Assuming that these five companies operate for eight years, the same amount of time that we used for the ETF scenario, they would need to be acquired for a combined $56 million for this investor to match the earnings of the ETF. If they wanted to get, say, a 5X return on their $1 million invested, then the sum of the acquisitions of all these five companies would have to be around 165 million, or about $32 million per company. Is that impossible? No, but it requires five good bets. Now let's look at the math when you invest with a VC fund. An investor brings the same million dollars into the VC fund. They're gonna pay 2% fees to the firm for managing their assets for about five years. So that means that effectively their cash going to the startups is $900,000. This fund invests in series A stages, which are safer. So let's assume that their failure rate is not 75%, 
but only 60%. And let's assume that the whole fund is about $50 million. So this particular investor is gonna own 2% of it. Now the fund is used to invest in 15 companies and based on that 60% success rate, only six of them will thrive. If the combination of these six companies gets sold for 260 million, then the venture capital fund would get around $100 million. That's a profit of $55 million or so, which means that the carry award for the venture capitalist is about $11 million. So out of the 88 left, the investor gets 2%, which is break even. That means that each company needs to be sold for $43 million or more in order to make the same amount of money as if they had invested in an ETF. If they want to 5X their investment, the companies would need to be sold for around $1.4 billion. That's $233 million per company. So here's a metric to put all of this into perspective. As a percentage of total investments made in the past decade, how many companies exit about 100 million or above 500 million? 3% of companies will exit above 100 million, 0.7 above 500 million, 0.2% above 1 billion, and 0.06% above 2 billion. So here is the IRR or investment return rate for some of the funds that Andreessen Horowitz raised in the past decade, as of September 2018. Notice how most of the funds are yet to outperform the S&P 500, and the only one that has achieved this was nine plus years old at the time of the study. And this is Andreessen, a very relevant venture capital fund. It is generally agreed that VCs have about a decade to raise capital, make their first and follow on investments in portfolio startups, and then oversee their assets to the best possible financial outcome. So there you have it. Now you understand where the money for your startup might come or not come from, and hopefully why investors might have rejected you. You have to prove that you can grow that big. If you want any help with that, that's what we're here for. So we have a pitch deck builder that helps you get your ideas investor ready. We have an investor finder that helps you find investors in your industry. And we can even help you write and design your slides. And we have a network of founders and investors available for office hours. Check us out at slidebean.com, not before hitting that bell button to subscribe to the channel. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next week.